Hello and welcome to another episode of the Funds Download. I'm Phil Graham, head of the investment funds team here at Harneys. And I'm really excited today to be joined by Vanessa Malloy, who heads up our, uh, our Luxembourg funds team. Vanessa, hi. Hi, Phil, and hi to the listeners. It's a really interesting one, this for me, because obviously we're very proud to have Lux as sort of the latest part of our armory on the global funds offering. And certainly for some people, they may say, well, you know, as a more traditional offshore law firm that has, that has offered sort of BVI and, and Cayman historically, why would you sort of add Luxembourg in at this stage? And then you look at the fact that it has approximately sort of 4,700 billion euros under management and actually ask the question, where on earth were you, Harnies, and why didn't you do this before? So, so it's clearly an enormously successful jurisdiction. I think, you know, second largest to the US. Why do you think Luxembourg has been so successful over such a long period of time? I think, you know, it really has been a success story. And there's a number of factors that have contributed to that. My personal opinion is that the primary reason has been the attitude of the government. So they've been very business friendly and also the way and the time frame within which they've adopted directives. So they were one of the first to adopt the USITs and the AIFMD. So for example, if you're going to have a Luxembourg fund, you're going to pay a small basis point tax but that's all you're going to pay. It's simple and it's not complicated. And I think being, you know, the first uh, mover advantage has really helped the jurisdiction because after all, it is in the center of the EU. It is part of the biggest trading block, but it's been able to capitalize on its positioning and its attitude to be commercial, to be able to really enhance the jurisdiction as a fund jurisdiction. And it's got such a good reputation. I mean, every single time, you know, wherever out there talking to, to managers, um, wherever we are in the world, you know, Luxembourg has that real sort of premier quality that has always been sort of fascinating to me. You know, how do you think it's managed to sort of keep that reputation whilst also, you know, maximizing its sort of flexibility and, and attractiveness? Well, it does have a triple A rating, and that has also helped to keep the jurisdiction as being regarded as a premier jurisdiction, but also the attitude of the regulator. So you yeah. have to acknowledge that it is a highly regulated jurisdiction, but the regulator, the CSSF, is pragmatic. So if you're thinking of coming to Luxembourg, and it's, you know, it's a difficult decision, then you need to you know, you arrange an appointment with the CSSF, you can meet them, you know, online, face to face, if there wasn't COVID-19, obviously, but you're able to then yeah. run through your project with them and able to identify what would be possible stumbling blocks. And they are able to give you some sort of guidance on how long the application would take. And this makes the jurisdiction far more user friendly from the outset, because let's be honest, BVI and Cayman is known to most people in the US when they come into Luxembourg, this is a totally different type of jurisdiction with a different type of regulatory framework. But at least by having an approachable regulator, that helps to be able to, you know, get somebody through the door, meet the regulator, build the rapport, and then move onwards. I fully agree with that. And without, without wanting to go into a slight negative, you know, I can vividly remember USITS 4 coming in uh, in 2009 and sort of being in New York and other places around the world and, and managers for the first time sort of beginning to dip their toes into, into that type of structure. And obviously those that are traditionally used to offshore vehicles, finding them just, you know, the, the comment you would hear is, wow, that this takes quite a lot of time. And, and, and obviously it comes at quite a high level of expense. But actually, you know, USITs are a fundamentally different type of structure. Is Luxembourg also building up its share of sort of the alternative fund side? Just coming back to USITs. So it is a retail product. It is meant yeah. for the man in the street. So it has a totally different overlay regulatory wise. Yep. So if you want to distribute into, you know, 70 jurisdictions, Luxembourg USITs, no brainer. You know, that's the starting point and the end and the end point. On the alternative side, there is really this hope that the AIFMD becomes a product. Obviously, the USITS is slightly different to the AIFMD in that one regulates the fund and the other the manager. But it's hoping that with the AIFMD that you have a product similar to, you know, it stands out and has a label like a USITS. 
and Luxembourg has really, really risen to the challenge. You know, there's been very interesting products that Luxembourg has brought out to be able to capture the alternative market because investors' appetites have changed and institutional investors and professional investors are able to bear more risk. So luckily to try and, you know, make alternatives more user-friendly, Luxembourg has come about introducing the RAVE. So it's not regulated by the CSSF. It's very quick to market. If you want to access the EU marketing passport and use the RAVE vehicle, you do have to appoint an authorized AIFM. But that means that you at least then are able to market in the EU using this passporting. And that is the key thing here, is that Luxembourg has tried to make itself user-friendly. Everybody knows the asset managers really want to concentrate on the performance of the portfolio. They don't want to be bogged down in uh, running the fund structure. And Luxembourg service providers have been able to really provide a framework on how a party can, for example, take a sub fund or hire a third party manco and then can concentrate on the typical asset management side of the business. Now, that probably sounds very exciting to a number of listeners who have you know, traditionally got that overlay of thinking it may be more, more complicated than they fully appreciate, especially with the RAFE. I mean, if a promoter was, was thinking about setting up in, in Luxembourg, having listened to your, your words of wisdom, Vanessa, where should they start with that? I like the words of wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think you need to obviously run the commercial factors first are the most important. So, you know, where are your investors based? Do you need to raise capital in the EU? And are your investments going to be based in the EU? So, you know, there's no reason why a BVI and a Cayman structure is not appropriate in a certain set of circumstances. But really, if you want to access the EU market, Luxembourg is really the entry point. So once you've decided, I definitely want to access professional investors in the alternative framework, then, you know, Luxembourg. What we try and do is then break down the jurisdiction for new managers coming on shore, if I could use that term. We try and set out a, an action list of all the things you need to take into account and also try and put forward the number of options. So there's a couple of options in Luxembourg for your pooling vehicle, your fund. You know, do you need diversification? Are you happy that the the fund vehicle itself is not regulated. So there's a couple of options, you know, that we try and identify and then we try and help the asset manager navigate. And so, and so much, you know, over the last few years, wh wherever you are on the planet has, has been in around, you know, actually putting physical presence somewhere, um, but actually, um, you know, having something. If someone wants to come in, but obviously doesn't yet have that physical presence in Luxembourg, what sort of solutions are available around that? Luckily enough, with the AIFMD, as you know, it really came out of 2008 and the 2009 crisis. Yeah. Whether the perception is correct or not, there was a concern that alternatives were creating the systemic risk. So Europe replied by taking the USITS man co framework and applying that to alternative managers. Yeah. But that means that if you want to be in, in the EU, you have to be subject to authorization and there's conduct of business rules, premises, you know, a number of things that you know, all increase the bottom line if you're trying to have a fund that's performing well. Luckily enough in Luxembourg and as well as in jurisdictions like Ireland, the third party main co solution has really been a way for asset managers to come into Luxembourg without having to hire their own people and their own presence. So there's a number of third-party mancos in Luxembourg that are able to provide the substance and then delegate out portfolio management to the asset manager regulated in a jurisdiction outside of Luxembourg. But that really has been a success story for Luxembourg. Now, for smaller sort of alternative managers, they may be listening to this and saying, that is of interest to me, but I always really thought that the likes of Luxembourg was was just not for me. I, I was never going to be the size, certainly from launch, to be able to use it. You know, it's interesting to hear about the Mancos, but do you find that smaller managers are still able to, to sort of get access? Yes, Luxembourg is able to give them some options. I mean, I think you need to draw a distinction between managers that are able to use the Manco solution, and we'll come back to that. Yep. And then managers that are able to use what is called a registered AIFM or sub-threshold AIFM. 
So the carrot for the AIFMD, because let's be honest, it's expensive to comply with the substance requirements under the directive. But the yep. carrot was always, you comply, you're authorized, you get the marketing passport. Yep. Now, for smaller guys, they don't get the marketing passport. They have to rely on the private placement regime applicable in each jurisdiction in the EU. Mm -hmm. But if the assets are under 500 million, for example, closed-ended, they are able to then register with the CSF. It's not an approval process. And they can then start up their fund. There is a difference between open and closed ended and also leveraged and unleveraged. But at least this provides a mechanism for managers, particularly alternative managers or real estate managers to come into Luxembourg and at least start a pooling vehicle and they can build their track record and then decide what they want to do from then onwards. For other managers, the Manco does provide a solution if you don't have a regulated entity. So some of the main codes in Luxembourg will allow you to go on the investment committee or you can act as investment advisor. So there's a number of options for managers, particularly on the alternative or real estate side, to be able to access the EU as a way of setting up their fund. Fantastic. You make it sound so, so simple. And I have to say, in every conversation you and I have had over the last few years, you know, I always come away thinking that you can break it down so well. So I mean, for any, anyone out there that wants to sort of investigate Luxembourg, I assume it's please get in contact and you'd be delighted to speak to them. Yes, yeah, so it is definitely our bread and butter helping new managers come into Luxembourg and understand the jurisdiction. We also like to introduce them to service providers and just to understand the thinking in Luxembourg. For example, if you have a regulated fund, you know, you have to appoint Luxembourg service providers because they're regulated by the CSSF and it helps to maintain the jurisdiction's appeal and reputation. So just trying to give them some insight into how the thinking happens in Luxembourg because that goes a long way in understanding, is my product appropriate for the jurisdiction? Absolutely. No, that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I think we'll look to conclude the podcast there because that's been incredibly straightforward and, and, um, and I really appreciate you doing that. I think it would, in my mind, definitely be worth sort of coming back and, and touching on some of those um, really interesting concepts that you raised. And uh, hopefully I can drag you onto another one of these podcasts uh, later in the series. Thanks, Vanessa. Thanks, Phil.